For several weeks now, we've been listening in as Jesus has given this, what we often call the Sermon on the Mount. And now we end up into chapter 7, and Jesus is about to wrap it up in this way. Listen to this, beginning in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Jesus is likely following up, if you were here last week, with what he said last week about these false prophets, false teachers. He's probably still pointing at them, but speaking to the larger audience too. Those folks who were self-deceived, who not only led people astray, as Crane says it, but it led themselves astray. They didn't know where they were at the end of the journey either. And it may make you wonder if they started out trying to be this way or along the way lost their way, but still here they are. And these folks have spoken the truth at times. Surely they said some things that were right. They had the right words. They know how to address the Lord himself. They might have done some good things, even some miraculous things. Notice Jesus doesn't say, no, you didn't. But it does not mean they would enter the kingdom of heaven. Heaven will not be occupied by those who seem religious. Verse 21 in the Living Bible says, Not all who sound religious are really godly people. I know we can all think of folks who look religious. They, they maybe can quote some scripture. Maybe if they start talking, big, big crowds want to hear them. Maybe they even do miracles. Some may conclude by looking at those kind of people and say, God must be with them. They're on the right path. They'll make it to heaven. But Jesus says, not so fast. Don't assume that. Some people like to get caught up in spiritual speak. Their language is all kinds of Christian. But their actions, if their actions aren't Christian, then the language is false. You may turn on the TV and hear some preachers say, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Hallelujah is a wonderful word. Praise Jehovah. Praise the Lord. That's what that means. Good! But rather than repeating a word, how about do it? Actually, praise the Lord in your life. It's a, if it's just an empty word, it's just emptiness. Meaningless. Even could be hypocritical. I'm not, I'm not blaming folks who use the word hallelujah. Please use it. It's a good word. But language itself can be deceiving. Appearances can be false. There's got to be some truth underneath all of this. And Jesus knows the person and he knows the heart. So listen, listen to this. Just because you hang around other disciples doesn't mean you are a disciple. Just because you show up at church doesn't mean you're a child of God's. Just because you look like the sheep doesn't mean you're part of the flock. Just because you say some things that sound religious and do some things that are really wonderful and even name the name of Jesus as Lord, it doesn't mean you know Him or, more importantly, that He knows you. Harris says this this phrase haunts him. He says, "What, what if I spent my life doing things that weren't really important to Jesus as they were to me? I mean, what if I said, Jesus, I I taught the Bible classes, and I preached the sermons, and I did all the good works in your name. And Jesus says, I I never really knew you. What, What I was interested in, he imagines Jesus saying, is you living a life free of materialism and full of integrity and love. What I wanted was a life lived according to what I just said in the sermon. Every person who identifies as Christian had better pay attention, and that includes preachers. He is speaking to me. As Lloyd-Jones says, a man can be so busy preaching in pulpits that he forgets and neglects his own soul. 
after you've preached your meetings and dealt with your apologetics and displayed your wonderful knowledge of theology and your understanding of the times and after you've read all the translations of the Bible and have shown yourself proficient in the knowledge of its mechanics, I still ask you, he says, what about your relationship to Jesus Christ? So could I ask you this morning, what about your relationship with Jesus Christ? I think most of you know if you're a guest, you may not, but my mother died a couple years ago, and she had Alzheimer's, and it was horrible to watch her near the end. The disease took over her mind, and early on, she started to forget little things like you and I forget, even as I get older. Like, where did I put my keys? It's funny for a while, and then after a while, she forgets more than that, and she started forgetting things that were more important. And by the end, it was, it was odd to look at my, my own mother who birthed me and raised me to know Jesus Christ. She, she didn't recognize me. And I, I, I looked in her eyes and we stared at each other and I was looking to see, is there even a twinkling there of knowing me anymore? And it was blank. It was just blank. I had become to her a stranger. A stranger. When Jesus says, I, I, I don't know you, I never knew you, he's, he's, it's not a moment of dementia or Alzheimer's. He's not forgetting. It, it's as if you are a stranger. You, the one he made, the one he adores, the one he tried to save. You, he may not even recognize you by the end of the journey. It's, 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 not, it's not his recognition that's messed up. It's his rejection that is true. I never knew you. Even to, to label evildoer. Because, because, listen, if you have played the game of hypocrisy, this is the end. For those who have kept religion as a, a side note, a hobby, a Sunday activity, instead of building your life on the very words of Jesus, on the will of God... This is where that path leads. And the warning is still for us today. It's still with us. Do you hear it? Stott says Jesus isn't impressed by our pious and orthodox works. He still asks for evidence. The sincerity of good works of obedience. Are you doing it? Jesus isn't done talking either. He adds this picture to the last picture. Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Makes you wonder uh, what Jesus knew about construction, doesn't it? How would he have known something about building? How would he have known how stone and wood go together and how it needs, needs to be built on a solid foundation? I wonder how often he watched his dad and how many times they might have gone out to a, a new place that had to be built or shoring up an old place that was starting to fail. And he, he must have learned the les lesson that foundations determine destinies. Foundations determine destinies. And our, our children know this. If they've grown up in church, they can tell you this story this parable in a song. They know the song, and the favorite part is at the end, smashed. The house is smashed. And we laugh, and we giggle, and we say, yay, we did it. It's smashed. And that is the story of a fool. The fool who can't learn the lessons of how to build a house and all of us had better learn the lesson today before it's too late as the story unfolds and the storms pass and there we are. And what does it look like in that moment? We'd better learn the lesson today lest we discover our houses are in shambles and our lives are over and our, our eternities are sealed. Foundations matter. I don't know if some of you have been overseas to Europe. I don't know if you've been to Italy. I don't know if you've seen this, but I've seen the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and I've been up in it. 
walked up in it. Our family went, and I got to climb the stairs and walk out. And it's, a, it's an amazing-looking place. And everybody, everybody in front has to do the same picture. They have the camera over there, and they put their hands up like they're holding it. And others, when you can, when it's not closed, you can walk up to the top. At least I got to do that. And I leaned out over and saw the glory of that magnificent building that's in some ways a disaster. It's known for all the wrong things. The architects, the builders might have thought, oh, people talk about this forever. And they are still, but not for good reasons. It was 1173 when they started it. And they got the first three stories, and it was already starting to tip to the south, and they discovered they had a problem. And the problem was pretty obvious. It's leaning. But the problem underneath the problem is the foundation was messed up. They built it on clay and sand and shells, and that doesn't work. They had a whole bunch of starts and stops for different reasons in their construction, and over the years, over the years, They've been working on it to keep it from falling all the way over, and they've done a decent job because it still stands today, and it still leans today as a testament to the truth. Foundations matter. Helmut Thielich was a German theologian who lived in Germany during World War II, and he survived. From the German point of view, it must have been interesting, and I, I read some of what he says. He wrote about the uncertainties of buildings during the Allied bombings as the Allies were bombing the German cities to try to win the war. He described the feeling that comes from these great stone buildings of ours not being so solid as we thought. Ordinarily, ordinarily the symbols of human security, our, our houses, our buildings, had suddenly become horribly uncertain places, places that might suddenly fall in on us. And he continued, he said, in peaceful times, one takes a simple delight in the, the, the house, looking at the, the house, the comfort of the living room, the fine view, everything that, that turns out in your life that says, isn't this nice? But suddenly there's a war, and the sirens scream at night, and fire and brimstone rain down for the skies. Then the question of the cellars and the foundations all of a sudden comes to the forefront. Then all at once, it's no longer important whether the house was spick and span and comfortable, because that can be swept away in a second. He said, then everything depends on whether it is sound and secure in the depths and whether you can find shelter there. See, we're, we're not really talking about houses here. I think you know that. Foundations matter. Security matters because storms do come. Not to houses. That's an easy thing. You watch them be built and you watch them being torn down. And what's the big deal in some ways? But when you talk about life, life is precious. When storms hit, and they will hit, will you make it? Will you be standing? Because things happen. Horrible things happen. And some of you have experienced these horrible things happening. Cope says, a spouse dies, a child dies, and some of you know when storms come like that, a Pharisaic righteousness will not carry you. Oh, it'll take you through the calm, all right, but not the storm. These storms are going to come in your life, he says, though I can't predict what they'll look like and whether your house of faith stands or falls depends entirely on where you have built it. We, we spend so much time looking at the outside, like, isn't that a nice house? Do you see that house? It's a beautiful house. And sometimes we look at each other's lives, too, and say, well, look at him and look at her. Isn't that wonderful? Just look at him. But two people can look almost exactly alike. Stott says both may be members of the visible Christian community. They go to church. They read the Bible. They listen to sermons. They buy Christian things. The reason you often can't tell the difference between those two is that the deep foundation of their lives is hidden. You don't see it. The real question is not whether they hear what Jesus is saying, respect it or believe it, but whether they do what they hear. And there is the difference. In all kinds of areas, there are the talkers and the doers. Any, any Monday morning after the big game's on TV and you will hear the talkers. The talkers go to school and go to work and say, you know what that coach should have done? You know what play he should have called? You know what the quarterback should have done? You know what the right fielder should have done? But those talkers don't change at all the outcome of the game. Husbands and wives can talk all kinds of good talk about how they wish they were better for the other one. I wish I was better to you. But do they change? 
Divorces speak of the inaction of making things actually better. And every New Year's Day brings all the talk of a new diet and a new workout routine and a new resolution to change my life, and it's often followed very quickly by nothing. High hopes, new plans, big dreams, and nada. Hey, remember three things. Actions trump words. Second, appearance doesn't matter. Foundations matter. And third, listening must be followed by doing. See, here we are, another Sunday. It's been a good Sunday, I think. Sung some good songs and quoted some scriptures and talked and shared communion. And look at this. Look what we've done. But now what do we do? We walk out the doors, we get in our cars, and we go home, and then we go to work, and then we go to school, and we keep doing things. But what are we doing? What are we doing? Maybe it's time to start something new, start something different. Maybe it's time to start with me. Maybe you heard the song on the radio, Casting Crowns, Start Right Here. We want our coffee in the lobby. We want our worship on a screen. We got a rock star preacher. That one's not true. Who woke, won't wake us from our dreams. We want our blessings in our pocket. We keep our missions overseas. But for the hurting in our cities, would we even cross the street? Yeah, we, wanna, we want the heart set free and the tyrants kneel. The walls fall down on our land to be healed. But church, if we want to see a change in the world out there, it's got to start right here. It's got to start right here. So Lord says, Lord... I'm starting right here. I'm starting right here. And I asked the question, what if the church on Sunday was still the church on Monday too? What if we came down from our towers and walked a mile in someone's shoes? It goes on. But you can imagine sitting in the hillside on that day as Jesus wraps up his sermon and there is this one big group of people, one group, his audience, listening to every word he says because he is good. But within that one group, there are really two groups. There are two audiences among the one, and the big difference comes down to this. Both hearing, both think about it, both probably walk away saying, that was good, that was really, really good. Maybe both groups contemplate later on in the week what he said and what he meant by what he said, but the difference came down to this, not so much the sermon, it's what they did with it. And I wonder if Jesus on that day didn't hear some people like I will hear a little later. No criticism, please. Good job, preacher. Nice sermon today. Well done. The both groups look very much alike. They all hear what Jesus says. But only one group, only one group walks away and starts living it. They don't just think about it in their head. They start moving with their hands and their feet and their heart. One of the last things Jesus said that we read was, do to others like you'd have them do to you. And one group says, I love that. And the other group says, now it's time for me to do that. So which are you? Today you are welcome to compliment the preacher all you want. You can admire the text and Jesus' powerful words You can praise all of us for the praise we have given to the fire. Father, you can say, this was good. But only one group will walk away from here doing the will of the Father. Don't worry about the words. Don't try to please anybody in here. Don't assume anybody is watching. Just hear what Jesus says. Not even what I say. Hear what Jesus says in this whole sermon, and now go and do it. So maybe you'll want to respond today by coming down front, and I I hope you would, if you've never done this, make a public statement of your faith in Jesus. I believe in Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. Change your ways. Turn your back on your old self. And be immersed into Christ, dying to yourself, dying to your sin, being united with Christ in every way so that you are with Him. And He is in you and for you and will be with you forever. Please do that. But since so many of the rest of us have already done something like that, instead of coming down here today, 
Maybe every one of us, every one of us who claims to be a disciple of Jesus, we could just go out there and do one simple thing after we've heard it, just live it. We've heard it. We listened to the sermon. We've all sat through this. Very good, Jesus. Very good. But now let's all go and do what we have heard. How is your house? What foundation are you resting on? How strong is your faith? What will you say when you stand before Jesus? But that almost doesn't matter. The better question is, what will he say to you? Don't let it be, I never knew you. Depart from me, away from you, you who do evil. Remember this. Only those who do the will of the Father in heaven will be with him in heaven forever. Do you hear the first scripture of the morning? When the tempest passes, the wicked are no more, the righteous are established forever. How is the foundation of your building today, and will it last? Church, time to go and do. Let's stand and